Hi, um, yeah, welcome to episode six of The Piper in the Cave. Uh, let me uh, first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm recording on. That's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to any indigenous people listening today. Um, yeah, episode six, and once again, I clearly have not delivered the uh, Patsy Tui Monaghan jig that I have been working on and I'm still working on. Um, it's very close to being done actually, but I wanted to interrupt um, scheduled programming, I suppose, to just pay a little tribute to the great Seamus Begley, uh, who passed away just in this last week. Um, you know, if you have an association with those tunes, it's very probably him, and particularly that absolutely extraordinary recording, uh, Mehor with Stephen Cooney. So, um, why, yeah, I guess what makes that so amazing is, you know, probably something that a lot of people will have different opinions on. For me, it is just, just the sheer, the sheer alchemy of those two musicians. I think that has very seldom been surpassed. And as far as between a, a melody player and an accompanist, I'm not sure it's ever been surpassed, honestly. I think that recording has to be one of the absolute touchstones for just that kind of um, chemistry, I suppose. And it's also, you know, many people's kind of um, go-to recording, or perhaps, um, perhaps Begley's work in general even, um, when you think of Kerry music, slides and polkas and so on. And um, I also want to talk a bit about that, I guess. A lot of pipers just don't bother when it comes to the Kerry tradition. Or, you know, they might play a few slides, a key slide or, um, you know, Valley Desmond polkas and so on, things that are likely to come up in a session, which is all well and good. Um, and I, yeah, I think there's good reason for thinking, you know, this is really a musical tradition or sub-tradition that is fiddle and box centric. And that is what is beautiful about it. And, you know, this instrument is designed for a pretty different musical atmosphere in some ways. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of reason to dig a little deeper at least before deciding, you know, that's not for me, wholesale. Um, and I'm certainly, you know, not claiming to be any kind of an expert on this music. I, um, you know, I've often been one of those people who sort of thought, oh, I might leave that for, for the musicians who do it best. But, you know, if we said that about everything, then we wouldn't play at all, would we? So, um, just a bit about these tunes first, I guess. Uh, three slides, they're all from that great um, Mehol album. James Begley and Stephen Cooney do try and suss it out if you don't know it already. Um, most of it's on YouTube. And um, they're not actually all from the same set. So I've taken the first one, Tamil Wadra, from one of the later tracks on the album. And then the next two, Eileen Niriadans and The Kings of Kerry are the two last tracks on a set of four, oh, sorry, the two last tunes in a set of four slides, um, which is probably the most famous track of the album. Uh, so the Tama Wadra is like a lot of these sort of very primordial, um, skeletal almost tunes as a, a song melody. And I think there's a few different sets of words. So Tama Wadra, um, I think it's Tama Wadra Squilta. Um, it's the, the song chorus, but my dog is on the loose, I think that would be. Um, maybe someone can correct me there. And, um, yeah, they, they even sing a chorus of that song on that recording too, which is really nice, interspersing it with the verse played as an instrumental. And, um, because it's a song, that's sort of my justification for what I was doing there in playing it without repeats and also ending on the first part on the A section 
because um, you know if you're singing chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, you're always going to end with the chorus and you might start with the chorus. So um, to me that's sort of how it how it made sense to play it, though you could play it perfectly well as a kind of a um, just AABB conventional slide thinking, you know, I'm not playing, I'm not singing the song, I'm playing this as a dance tune, therefore it should, uh, should adhere to the formal conventions of dance music, which is also fine. If you're not playing for dancers, just do what you want, really. Um, and then the final tune, The Kings of Kerry, is um, maybe also worth talking about, because that is not a traditional Shalif Lukra or Kerry tune or anything. Um, that was actually written for for Begley and Cooney. They are the kings of Kerry music. Um, and I found conflicting reports as to whether it was a solo composition by Mike Scott of the Water Boys, or whether it's also, um, whether we should also be giving compositional credit to Steve Wickham and Sharon Shannon, who were his bandmates at the time. But in any case, um, I think fits very well alongside the, the traditional repertoire they play too. Uh, and I have changed a few keys, as I often will in approaching music on the pipes. You know, the Kings of Kerry would be played, as it often is, in A. And I think given that um, the chance is playing, I think in D, D sharp box, it actually sounds in B flat. But you know, and it works perfectly well on the chanter. Something like that. Um, you know, in a session, absolutely play it in that key. But I kind of, I wanted to bring in the regulators there and have a lot more options if it's in G. And it also, you know, sits in a more more final sense against a D drone if it's in G than if it's in A when you're kind of left hanging or suspended for want of a better word. Great. Okay, some thoughts on slides in general, how we might approach these on the pipes. Um, and I think the first thing to be aware of is that while there is a lot of there's a very grey area between slides and jigs, and a lot of tunes will um, will work either way and are traditionally played in both ways. And a lot of times also people will say, well, you know, perform slides in the repertoire sense, largely using a jig rhythm. And that also tends to work fine because they're good tunes, they're gonna work. Um, but this album, you know, this is real slide stuff. They're almost, unmistakable um, as jigs, in a sense. And I think that presents some pitfalls if you're, um, if you're playing them. One is, I'm playing them a lot faster than I normally play. I'm not a fast player. And that was probably a slightly uncomfortable tempo for me, but I felt it was necessary to kind of capture the feeling of the slide and, and even more so the feeling of that album where there is just this kind of incredible um, propulsion and drive to it. Not saying I successfully captured the feeling of that album, but that's what I was going for. And when you start doing that, things, um, you realise what will and won't work in terms of when you can get away with using some, some jig tricks that you probably have more of than slide tricks and when it doesn't. So the one I want to mention first is I think, um, not using too many rolls can really help um, help things feel a bit more slidey. And um, so what I mean there, I'll give an example. Right, time Aladra. Um, that was, you know, a slowish tempo then. Um, but at that tempo, if you wanted to make it sound like a jig, sure. start putting in some rolls like that. But I feel um, the rolls are a very gentle gentle kind of, um, what's the word, there's a, a word for that, gentle sort of meandering feel they often have. 
and I feel those slides are just a bit more gutsy in some sense. Um, you know, rolls, if you're gonna, if you're gonna lilt your sort of thing, they diddly diddly, all of that stuff. But I feel it's a much more articulated sort of feel that's going on here. Um, and if you listen to, to Begley's phrasing, very often when he is playing, um, playing all three notes, like that, Um, very often he is actually putting a bit of staccato there, which, you know, could just be a function of how they sit on the box, of course, but that is also part of the, the style and approach, whether it's, you know, fully intentional or defined by the instrument to some extent. Uh, and because of that, I, like I said, I don't play a lot of roles. What I do do is, um, use some of the staccato things that we have a lot of as pipers and I feel that kind of matches a bit of that articulation he's getting so some of that bottom hand stuff quite often oh, um, there's, there's another one there yeah I do it in the, the second one too um, that's the one just because that bottom hand you know D, E, F sharp in the, and G in the high octave lend itself to, so well to staccato using some of that um, in a way that might be a bit too heavy handed if you're doing it in a jig I think can actually serve you quite well here. And the other thing that's sort of a bit different to how you'd approach a jig is very often when you're using a staccato triplet, um, you'll be actually using it to form a quadruplet, meaning um, you're adding an extra note into things, you know, so. that would kind of almost get in the way of the feel, if, even if you could get that cleanly and I couldn't. Um, but that means you can just sort of use them as a one-to-one -one replacement of the, the triples that occur naturally in the melody. Might be, you might do in a jig, but it's probably less likely, I think. So I think because you have this kind of arsenal of little staccato figures like that, that can actually be a real asset in playing this music on the pipes. And um, it's worth exploring, you know, even if that comes from quite a different impulse, those um, staccato things, which are perhaps more of a a um, ornate sort of thing than this music requires or benefits from. Um, I think the same kind of techniques and just learned vocabulary can assist here. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about is just a rhythmic thing here. And I'll use maybe the same, uh, same tune there, Tama Wadra. Um, one thing that's really striking when you hear, um, you know, really heavy Kerry players and Schleswiger players playing slides and polkas is that it can sometimes be hard to tell them apart. Um, so, you know, your um, so 
So when you have the gap, which I mean, one, three, one, two, um, you know, when you're not playing all three notes of on every beat, so you have a long note, short note, long note, short note sort of thing. Um, if you're playing that figure in a jig, you can actually often, and it's quite nice to extend that first note and compress the last one a little bit. Um, so if this was, if this were a jig. Exaggerating slightly there, but that can be a nice little um, subtle modification of the rhythm and melody there. I think it's death to a slide and you want to do the opposite often. You want to push that second note, make it longer. So they're almost even. Um, and that's that's what I mean by slides and polkas sounding a bit the same. It becomes quite even when you play those, and you hear it's quite a similar rhythm in the end. And another place um, I think I'm trying to emphasise that is in the second tune, Eileen the Weirdons. So you have that. And trying to make it to da 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 again, I think we'll interfere with that slide rhythm. So. You can get away, especially at tempo, with actually basically playing those as even. Um, to me, when you have those phrases where you do have a few notes with the gap or two notes per beat, however you like to think of them, in a row especially, you can really kind of use that to check in to having this bass rhythm that you want um, and make sure you're not letting habits from playing a different style of music um, with a different approach slip in. Um, and just one final thing I want to talk about, which is not remotely, well, not specific to uh, slides and this kind of repertoire, but has a connection, I think. Um, it's a technique thing, but I think I was doing a lot of them on those low E's in Eileen the Reardon's, and even on... Oh, I'm doing something different now, I'll talk about both. So that's like a really, really compressed cram. Only two, two grace notes there. No, that was three. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so what I'm playing is... So the, the fingers I'm lifting there are the G and the A. And trying to really just get that as tight as possible. So like not tight, as in piping tight, like as close as possible. Um, again, just trying to get like a really gutsy, kind of heavy articulation because we don't have dynamics in, a, in much, in, except in the most subtle of senses on the pipes. Um, so we need to use those kinds of fingering tricks to give weight. And I think, you know, if I were playing a box, I would be wanting to really belt, probably an out on Beverly's box, isn't it? But either way, I would be wanting to really um, emphasize that with the bellows. Can't do it with these bellows. So I'm trying to use a fingering trick to give that, that impression of a really heavy, emphasized, weighty articulation um, in a sense. And a slightly different one I'm doing that is, gives a similar result, but just fits differently under the fingers is in Kings of Kerry. Yeah, so what I'm doing there. Trying to get a similarly sort of sound on that E there. 
and I'm not, I probably could do an extra little cupboard, kind of. Um, what I'm actually doing is delaying a regular cut. So there's just a single cut there, but I'm letting the E sound for a fraction before I let that cut happen. So rather than being a clean, um, it's subtle, but I think it gives just a slightly thicker attack to that note. Just slow it down. Can't really do it on the low D. Yeah, you can actually if you cut with a different finger. Haven't thought of that. I'm confusing myself by trying to introduce things I didn't do before. But the idea is just that little bit of less than perfect precision is actually giving you a really um, a really interesting and um, I think striking effect there. It's very subtle, but you know, this music is all about building enough subtleties in to, um, to create something. So yeah, just to reiterate there, the idea is practicing a cut, so a conventional cut, A to E. You're sort of clean, sounding the A, then the E. What I'm doing. Is letting the E sound for a fraction before that. It's easier to do in context, actually. Just be a little bit lazy with your fingers if you are, um, if you are um, more, perhaps more precise than me, because um, I just do it instinctively. But if you do, um, aim at really getting those cuts as clean as possible, and that is an entirely noble and wonderful aim. Mess around with making them a bit less perfect, because sometimes that might work in your favour. Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to talk about today. Um, hopefully, yeah, you've enjoyed this little excursion. Please do check out um, all of Seamus Beckley's music you can find, because it's extraordinary. Um, and I did want to, yeah, dedicate this to his memory and just this incredible impact he's left on the tradition. But thank you for uh, tuning in and um, I will do that uh, Patsy Tui when I heard you uh, quite soon though. So I'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you.